All right, hello everyone and welcome to uh, the second in a series of uh, three webinars uh, from the Tau Center for Digital Journalism on redefining the local news crisis. My name is Sam Ford. I'm a, a fellow with Tau Center for Digital Journalism and uh, have a background in um, journalism and research around journalism. Also uh, currently work at, as Director of Cultural Intelligence with Tiller Press at Simon & Schuster. Uh, we have a panel today uh, uh, here to discuss community-centered models uh, in particular. So as you probably uh, saw in the description, there's a lot of discussions around um, how the crises uh, facing local news ha uh, have been put in context of the, the journalism industry perspective. Here today, we really want to talk about it from the community perspective first. We want to think about uh, that uh, vantage point and how it gives uh, uh, visibility to the complex factors that play on the ground in many communities. Uh, we have a couple of researchers uh, who are joining us today who I've had the pleasure of working with uh, over the past few years on this subject. Uh, Andrea Wenzel, who's assistant professor at Temple University's uh, Klein College of Media and Communication, and Latrell Crittenden, program director and assistant professor of communication at Jefferson University. Uh, they'll start us off here in a minute sharing uh, s the thrust of some of the work they've been doing of late, but really that has been a focus uh, of uh, the Tau Center for, before you know it, five years now of, of work uh, around these issues. We also have Mike Romain joining us, who's editor of the Austin Weekly News uh, in Illinois, and Maleka Fruin, who is a community organizer with the Germantown Info Hub in Pennsylvania. So. We're going to have uh, uh, give the first part of this discussion uh, over to a chance for Andrea and Latrell to share some of the work they've uh, done over the past few years. Uh, and then we will uh, have a discussion amongst us that will include some of the great work that Maleka and Mike have been doing on the ground and what they've been learning from it. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Latrell. Uh, who will be sharing, who will kick us off sharing some of the research he and Andrea have been uh, uh, conducting. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Again, my name is Latrell Crittenden and I am Assistant Professor of Communication uh, at uh, Jefferson. And I'll just be uh, starting off with a brief discussion and overview of our uh, research uh, that we've been doing uh, over the past uh, several years. Look, we all know that news is in trouble. Uh, we've seen mass layoffs. We have ghost papers, hedge fund newspapers, media deserts, and all of us know this because we see this in study after study uh, that shows that when lo local news loses uh, civic life, when there's less local news, there's less uh, civil right, uh, civic life going on. Um, government costs go up, fewer people are running for different offices. Uh, so in responding to some of the concerns about local news, uh, there have been a number of initiatives that have been popping up to try and save local news. But that really raises a question. Who are we saving local news for? Uh, yes, not having local news is a problem, but leaving an out but it basically, if this particular outlet does not represent the entire community uh, that is fair or represent uh, that is fair and representative, uh, that is a problem. In many communities, we are seeing uh, the reporting by the remaining outlets to be about those communities rather than for those communities, and this is especially pop uh, especially a problem in historically marginalized communities where people may feel socially distant from the journalists, even though they are in close proximity with those journalists. All right. And, and forgive me, there might be a, a small um, co-presenter in my background that will make some noise from time to time as my baby's right here and I don't have childcare. Um, so since 2015, uh, with the, the support, generous support from the Tau Center, um, I've been able to talk to some people in communities like what Latrell just mentioned, where people shared that they felt that they only saw journalists when something terrible happened. Um, but we also talked with them in our research about what would a better relationship look like with these people, with between local news and, and communities. Um, and I won't torture you with academic um, theory. However, um, for these projects, I do draw on 
this question of, you know, how, not just how can we save local journalism, but how can we strengthen the communication networks of communities? Um, and I use the communication infrastructure theory as a guiding theory. Um, basically, it looks at how residents, local media, and community groups share stories about their community. And researchers have found in neighborhoods where there's strong connections between these different actors, people tend to have a stronger sense of um, belonging and more civic participation. Um, and so we started out in South LA, we tried to work on strengthening this network by hosting workshops where we would try to connect community organizers who historically distrusted local news and connecting them with local journalists. Um, and they collaborated to produce a series of solutions journalism stories. Um, then later in Chicago, I observed WBEZ's Curious City Project where they asked people using Harkin to share questions they want reporters to explore. And I followed them as they try to see what kinds of outreach, outreach strategies would most effectively connect with communities that historically weren't participating. Um, and especially majority Black and Latinx um, neighborhoods in the, in the city, where they found that the best way to collaborate with was with library branches that would do face-to-face -face outreach along their work. Um, after that, I got to work with Sam and uh, we wanted to understand what could we use a communication infrastructure model to design research-based local journalism interventions? So we, we focused on these two areas in Western Kentucky. They're majority white, majority Republican areas. Um, and we tried to explore how people got local news and also how political polarization was affecting their lives. Um, the short version of what we found is, you know, despite polarization, when it came to local news, there were outlets um, that people from across the political spectrum were still sharing. And there was, a, there was a desire for local news that was less negative and that had more community involvement. Um, so we shared these findings in a workshop with community members and journalists, and we got their input on what we could do to follow up. This is, so one of the projects that came out of this is involved an outlet called the OC Monitor, and this is the OC Monitor. <laughs> this is Dustin and Lee Bratcher. Um, they're the owners, they're the editors, the reporters, and the photographers. Um, several of the ideas that came from this workshop looked at how to take community traditions and reimagine them. Um, so one tradition they had was society columns, which Sam is intimately familiar with, um, and they reimagined this as community contributors. Um, the other tradition they looked at was something called liars tables. This is not my word for them. Um, this is, if you go to uh, various parts of Kentucky um, in the convenience store in the morning, you're likely to find tables full of older gentlemen as sitting around having coffee and as they would say, solving the world's problems. Um, these are mostly farmers, coal miners, and retirees. And it's how they circulate information about what's going on in their part of the county. And so Dustin and Lee wanted to connect with their information with the OC monitors readers. And so they did this liars tables tours um, to try to do that. Um, so the, the case that we had followed there, we, we followed a community centered process where we did a study of needs and assets, then we brought them together to design a project and then we piloted and monitored these projects. And this is not, these are not scalable projects. So it, we aren't, proposed, we knew that we wouldn't work to do a liar's table tour in South LA or in South Side of Chicago. Um, but what could this process be followed in other places was the question that we came out of this with. Let's One of the next places that we actually uh, decided to look at was in the Philadelphia area, specifically in Germantown and Montgomery County, which is right outside of the border of Philadelphia. Um, and that particular study uh, looked at uh, the different residents' relationships with local media. And one key finding was that particularly in Germantown, a lot of that coverage was disproportionately focused on uh, negative news and focused on crime. Uh, so after we actually uh, started to do the work in uh, Germantown, we held a number of uh, research uh, workshops to discuss findings and recommendations to get perspective on what could actually be done to improve that situation, specifically uh, in Germantown. And this led to a pilot intervention uh, known as the Germantown Info Hub. And basically it, it tackled two main goals. One, we wanted to improve the circulation of hyperlocal information within these communities. 
uh, specifically uh, the Germantown uh, community, which really is separated by two separate neighborhoods. And we also wanted to improve how the community is represented by strengthening relationships between communities and media, not just uh, what's in Germantown, but media in general. And we've done that through creation of an advisory group, working with staff and a community organizer who you'll get to meet. Uh, we have a reporter and we also have uh, occasional classes at both Jefferson and at uh, Temple where uh, those individuals help write stories uh, along with uh, continuing research uh, that we're actually presenting. Uh, so before COVID, one of the main things that we really attempted to do was face-to-face -face outreach. Uh, and also, one thing that we've also continued to do is we also send out text announcements on a regular basis to keep uh, our uh, people who are following us uh, aware of what's going on. And we also have a website uh, where we share news and information on a regular basis. Uh, but one of the main things that has been very successful is that we have had monthly community discussions with residents uh, where they pick a topic or they nominate a topic and we actually bring them together and we have conversations about these issues from gun violence to redevelopment uh, to even trash collection, which is a major issue. We also have accountability discussions where we invite local journalists to come and discuss a story that they have already done or they're working on uh, as it pertains to Germantown. And the idea is so the community members can give some feedback to that particular uh, issue. Uh, and this is something that is ongoing and uh, we're going to continue uh, to do this research and work, uh, do the work with the Info Hub. So the Germantown Info Hub has had some successes so far, but our argument isn't that we want to try to clone this project and do it in different places. Sorry. <laughs> um, even within Philadelphia, from one neighborhood to the next, it wouldn't make sense to do the same project. Each community has different needs and different assets, and these necessitate different responses. Um, but we, you know, from trying this out in Kentucky and then trying out in Philly, we can see that there is a a logic to having a process that is portable. Um, and just to, re you know, refresh what that process was. So, you know, we try to assess the community's information needs and assets. We try to share with residents, study participants, the results, and along with community stakeholders and local journalists, have a workshop where we invite them to brainstorm interventions. We circle back with community stakeholders and journalists to then pilot those interventions. And then we try to monitor and evaluate the projects that grow out of it. Um, so we've been trying to adapt this model to a few more locations that we're especially interested in because they get at the issue of inclusivity in local news. Um, so you know, often when we talk about how black and brown communities are not well served by local news, um, we're talking about major cities. Um, but we wanted to better understand what this looks like and means in small towns and in suburbs. And so the first area that we looked at was Proviso Township, um, where there's several majority black suburbs. And in a moment, you're going to hear from Michael Romaine, who runs the community paper called Village Free Press in that area. Um, we asked residents when we did our study there about their information needs and assets. And I'll let Mike share more. Um, you can also read more in our Tau study that we did here. Um, but in brief, residents told us that they appreciated the local news they got from the Village Free Press, but they saw that there were more, you know, there were resource limitations to this paper, which is a free paper. Um, and they shared a wish list, which included things like more accountability reporting, um, opportunities to participate in the local journalism process, and also you know, having news and basic information in Spanish to serve the growing Latinx community. Um, so we, we worked with Bill Tree Press and facilitated a workshop which led to the design of a community news ambassador project, which Mike can share about. Um, because of COVID, the activities of this project had to be adapted to shift from talking about the census to focusing on COVID. Um, they did town halls about COVID and race and about COVID in schools. Um, but the framework that was started um, it was, was established through this process and, and I'm curious to hear from Mike more about where it's going to go from here. And finally, we want to, 
And uh, finally, what we want to do is talk about another final project that took place in Franklin County, uh, Pennsylvania, and the county seat of Chambersburg. That is in what James Carlville called the Alabama portion of the state. It's very ruby red politically. Um, but what is not really emphasized is the fact that Chambersburg, the borough, has a uh, community of color that's about 30% of the population, which puts it on par with a place like Pittsburgh. However, you do not necessarily see that it reflected uh, in the news. So uh, we decided to take a look at what were the, new, the community information needs of Chambersburg in general, but we did want to place a special emphasis on communities of color uh, in Chambersburg. And basically what we found was that due to massive cutbacks in local media, one, the local newspaper once had 20 reporters, they're now down to two. So everybody basically felt across the board that their needs were not being met. But when you talk to uh, Latinx members and African Americans, their need, needs weren't being met prior when the newspaper had uh, more than 20 reporters. Uh, and additionally, they felt that they were heavily stereotyped in the news uh, and that major issues uh, related to their communities were not uh, being served. And the other thing that we found was a lot of the information more broadly stayed in silos. African-American uh, community stayed in one silo, Latinx community stayed in another, white community stayed in another. So there wasn't information uh, that was being shared across these specific communities. So following the release of the actual uh, paper, we uh, attempted to uh, bolster uh, a lot of the coverage in the local community through a pilot intervention where we trained uh, local residents to uh, conduct their own news. Uh, and also we attempted to translate stories from English to Spanish. This is an ongoing effort, but it has been slowed down to some degree uh, by COVID. However, we did get a little, uh, there's another grant that we actually just recently received that will allow us uh, to continue this work. Additionally, as a result of the community discussions that took place after uh, this particular uh, story came out, the local newspaper, the public opinion, decided to apply for its own grants to try and better cover uh, communities of color inside of uh, Chambersburg, which is an effect of the actual sort of the advocacy effect of our work on the larger uh, news ecosystem. Uh, so with that, uh, we uh, thank you for your time and we would like to uh, basically answer any questions that you uh, have for us uh, regarding our work. Yeah, just to, just to echo that, um... Certainly encourage people, don't wait until later in the webinar to throw your questions in. We'll be weaving them in um, as the discussion goes along. Specifically, just because you, you just touched on it, uh, there's a question uh, that the grants, did they come, were any of the grants from the Facebook Journalism Project specifically, or where, where were the grants you were mentioning uh, come from? Yes, yeah, so uh, there was a grant that came through uh, that particular uh, uh, project. Um, there, there was a grant for WHYY, which is a Philadelphia-based outlet. That was a Facebook journalism grant, but it didn't go specific. I mean, it, it, it went to them for a larger project. Um, I should also say, I mean, it, I think these smaller communities have a harder time getting the Facebook journalism grants. I know of others that applied and did not get it. So if you're kind of off the map of the Facebook journalism radar, um, I think that that's a bit of a challenge. And the most recent grant that we're going to continue, it hasn't been formally announced yet. So uh, before we, we uh, I don't want to say who it is, but it's, it is, uh, it should be announced within the next uh, couple of days. All right. I I'd love to hear a little bit more, Maleka, from you. We've heard a bit about the Germantown Info Hub uh, in uh, Latrell and Andrea's presentation. In particular, in your uh, role as a community organizer with the Info Hub, I'd love to hear more from you about what that role entails, what your what your position is, and uh, you know, kind of what you see on on the ground uh, in this project at the Germantown Info Hub. Thanks, Sam, and thanks, Andrea and Latrell. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Maleka, and as, uh, as you've heard, I'm the community organizer for the Germantown Info Hub. I've lived in Germantown for almost 14 years. 
which seems like a long time to me, but in Germantown, it's not that very long. There's many people here in the neighborhood that have lived here their entire lives and have had multiple generations here. So one of the things that I do as a community organizer is just be humble and listen to my neighbors and really connect on a lot of different ways to what people have been doing in this neighborhood for decades. And one of the things that is exciting to me about the Germantown Info Hub is even though it is a new project, what it's bringing up to the surface for um, many, many people in my neighborhood is work that many of the older folks who have been here have been doing for a long time and haven't been highlighted in the me in media, in local media or in the media in Philadelphia. And many, many people in my neighborhood are very engaged. They have been doing lots of different work to try to focus and work on solutions in Germantown. And that's what we're trying to focus on. We're trying to focus on what solutions they've already been working on. Um, so one of the ways that I try to connect with people before I was tabling and in person, right now I'm trying to go to a lot of different virtual meetings. So the meetings that I'm trying to go to are people who, uh, different meetings with RCOs, registered community organizations, uh, civic meetings where people are just meeting together in neighborhood groups, um, meetings with people who are friends of different parks or libraries. I try to uh, connect with people on church bulletins and virtual uh, email discussions with different churches and faith-based organizations in the neighborhood and with a lot of different service providers in our neighborhood. There are a lot of people that offer resources and services in Germantown. So one of the things that we did recently was a virtual town hall. Um, and that was based off of research and a focus group that Andrea and Latrell did. And one of our, one of the people that was in the, in the focus group asked if they could bring service providers together to see what they were doing during COVID-19 and to see where the gaps were that maybe people in our neighborhood needed. And so when we brought everybody together in a Zoom room, we learned um, what a lot of different people were doing with food distribution, with health, with lots of different things. And with those connections that we had in that virtual town hall, I continue to check in with them and see what the updates are for what people are doing now and what, what people need what's the new food distribution now. As people probably know, um, Philadelphia and the school district of Philadelphia is a virtual school right now. So we are still in a situation where a lot of people need different food distribution. They need resources while of childcare and perhaps remote learning centers. So these are the things that we keep on learning about in COVID-19. Meanwhile, Mike, we heard some uh, some initial details uh, from Andrea about the work that you're uh, doing uh, at the Austin Weekly News, some of the community engagement you've done, as well as how some of that's moved virtually. Just love to hear more uh, from you about your initial strategy in this experimentation and then how it has uh, continued to adapt uh, as time has gone on and, and as everything has changed in this 2020. COVID year? Yeah, so I, I started uh, Village Free Press in, in 2013 as a, a blog, a WordPress blog, um, and quickly realized that um, I had an a audience that really appreciated the information. Um, so um, I pivoted from being a blog to wanting to, to uh, operate it as a, a newspaper with the same ethics of a newspaper um, and the same focus. Um, uh, on particularly on um, city council issues. Um, and so uh, in 2015, I was able to uh, catch the attention of a local news publisher in the area of um, four community weeklies and uh, started freelancing and, 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 and about a year and a half into that, I was picked up as a staffer. So uh, I'm, I'm actually um, a part-time 
um, publisher of Village Free Press um, and a full-time um, editor of Austin Weekly News, education reporter of Wednesday Journal um, and Forest Park Review. Those are the weekly community newspapers that Growing Community Media, my, my nonprofit employer, um, owns. So I do all of that uh, at the same time uh, and try to juggle um, those balls. Uh, it's difficult. Uh, so um, in 2016, I was able to, to um, go into print um, as a weekly newspaper. So Village Free Press comes out every, every Wednesday. Uh, and we used to pu uh, publish about 3,000 copies. We had to reduce that to roughly 1,100 due to COVID. Um, we wanted to contain our print costs. Uh, and, and up until the time I met Andrea and Latrell, it was really, and it still is to, to a great degree, a one-man show or with respect to Village Free Press. Um, and, but uh, the focus groups that they did last summer um, with a variety of community members in, in Maywood, which is my main suburb that I cover, um, in addition to Merrill's Park, Broadview, and, Bro um, and um, Bellwood, those are three neighboring suburbs that, that I try to cover as well. Uh, a lot of those people during those focus groups said that they want to see the newspaper uh, be more of a collaborative effort. They want to see more bylines instead of just my own. Uh, they want to see more people um, operating it in, 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 you know, in association with the paper. And so they, a few of them came up with the idea. There was one person in particular who came up with the idea of a news ambassador program. Um, uh, which would basically appoint some, you know, valuable readers who really appreciate the newspaper, appreciate um, getting the information, regularly, regularly engaged with the paper. Um, they would be kind of, you know, representatives, um, ambassadors of of the the newspaper as a brand, as a as a, a, a product, but more importantly, as a service to the community, um, they would, you know, allow us to, to um, they give me news tips and stuff like that, a variety of roles, help with fundraising. Uh, the, so the, the first idea we had was to um, leverage these, one, identify roughly between three and five uh, people to serve as news ambassadors. Uh, and the first task that we had was to, to organize these virtual town halls um, related to COVID and other issues, other inter, inter, interrelated issues. Um, so the first was uh, COVID-19 and race. We had um, in Maywood, which is predominantly African-American with, with a growing Hispanic population. Um, there are other predominantly Hispanic suburbs that are nearby and that we try to service. Uh, we realized that this, this virus was uh, disproportionately impacting African Americans in, in that readership. Um, and so the first town hall was uh, discussing the interrelation between COVID-19 race. Um, medic we, we interviewed um, some physicians in our area, um, just some regular um, network uh, individuals who are part of a lot of different um, organizations in the area. Um, and we offered some some tips uh, on for uh, our Black and uh, Latinx readers about how to cope. The second one, and that was in August, uh, the second virtual town hall that was planned by ambassadors was uh, in uh, September, and that was related to COVID-19 in, in education, but primarily remote learning. So all of the districts in our readership um, decided to do 100% virtual learning. So all those students are learning at home. But the problem is that we, in our, in, in, in our, in our school districts, uh, parent involvement is, is, it was a struggle before COVID-19. Um, and it's definitely a struggle afterward. Um, a lot of parents are working, they can't be at home. Um, a lot of them are essential employees. So in a lot of, uh, and so I, I covered, uh, some diverse communities as an education reporter in Oak Park for a uh, Wednesday journal. Um, I, I, I see how wealthy uh, families are, uh, are um, coping with COVID-19 and the resources that they have. And then uh, as a uh, publisher of Village Free Press, I see how some of our black and brown and low income families are, are, are coping and it's just radically different. And so uh, that discussion was how to bridge the divide. And so there was some advice that, 
um, that some people from Oak Park, which we, introduced, we, we uh, uh, invited to that conversation, that they were able to give to some of our readers and, and some of our families in, in our Village Free Press readership. Uh, so it was an interesting um, mix of participants and uh, it was a pretty rich information exchange. And so we're gonna follow uh, that up with uh, one in October um, and that's gonna be related to COVID-19 and voting. Uh, and it'll be just before the November election. Well, while we're on the subject of uh, how to move these sorts of community engagement models into the virtual realm in the midst of the pandemic, I know there are probably multiple folks listening in today and we've gotten a, a question about what tips when it comes to remote and virtual efforts do you all have? What, have, what has worked well for you so far? Are there some things that haven't worked well when it comes to moving this engagement virtual? Uh, and uh, of course, Latrell and Andrea, if there are things you've seen with some of the other organizations you've been working with, feel free to chime in too. I would say, um, uh, so one, pre preparation is really important. We meet with the, our ambassadors every week. Um, even after these uh, sessions are, were over, um, we've been meeting with them every week. Uh, there are about two or three who are faithful and who meet with us every Friday uh, to try to plan these these things and it allows us to talk about other, uh, other issues in the community as well. Uh, so I think preparation is key. Uh, the first one, it was kind of more of a conventional format. Uh, I thought we could do more with it. It was just kind of like a traditional panelist, uh, you know, panelist style where they talk for several minutes and then um, some, some people in the audience ask, ask questions via chat. The second one was much more interactive. Um, and so I think we, we kind of switched up the, the, the format, um, but I think we, were, we, we learned from the first one and carried over what we learned to that second one. So uh, the more we, we do these, we, the, more, the better we get at them. Uh, and it's just a matter of preparing, uh, making sure you're taking feedback from the last ones that you do so that you can improve the, 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 the next ones. Um, and, uh, Making sure that you, you know you you have enough time to market as well to and to promote um, ahead of time. Uh, those were some of the things that helped us uh, in the in the last one that we did to to improve on the first one. I wonder if Maleka wants to jump in to share a little bit about how the Info Hub has been trying to handle that transition. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, one thing I've noticed that really has um, helped with community engagement staying active um, as far as virtual goes is that Germantown, our neighborhood has really active Facebook groups. They're very local, they're hyper local. We have a few of them and some of them are very specific, Germantown parents and families. One of them is more general, Germantown gardeners. And one way that I think that has been working to share our content, but also to have more people interact with us and give us ideas and concerns with what they're interested in is going to those specific Facebook groups and posting information that they want directly. So if there's something about gardening, if there's something about food distribution, I'll, I'll go and post it specifically on um, very different Facebook pages, which seems obvious, but it really, they, they just are very active and involved on Facebook. Um, and of course, other forms of social media, our Twitter and Instagram have been helping a lot too, as far as the virtual goes. And I think that what another tip or observation that I would give is one of the reasons why I think we had a lot of different service providers on that virtual town hall is because not only did we remind people and email people, but we also called people directly, direct phone calls. Uh, we called every single person and we had a conversation with every person. And I think that is uh, something that really makes a difference. That's great. Well, another question that has come in, uh, and Andrea and, and Latrell as well, I might uh, direct this at you. It, for, for folks who are looking to bring together uh, uh, or uh, invest in a community uh, focused model, as you think about some of the key stakeholder organizations or types that, you, that are vital to bring to the table and bring to the conversation, 
Um, you know, you all have been researching this for uh, a few years now and have looked at a variety of different models. Who are some of the groups or types of stakeholders most important to, to bring into the conversation when you, when you commit to a community-centered approach? Um, I would just say that if, if you have an opportunity to do an even a really basic sort of information needs assessment with your community to begin with, that'll answer that question. Um, because you want it, community organizations are really critical, but if you don't know already what community organizations are most relevant to people, um, if you can do like a basic survey or like some basic focus groups um, to try to find out from people how are they already, what resources are already there in the community that they could then sort of be built upon, um, because those are folks that you might want to partner with for various activities or various you know ways of doing outreach. Um, but if you can kind of do a little bit of groundwork at the beginning, it could save you further down the road. <laughs> um, if you can kind of do a little bit of, of outreach to try to establish what are the organizations that people are connected to, and um, I mean that will that will present open up some other opportunities to kind of work with them down the road potentially. And I would just add that when you are doing that work, keep in mind that uh, that initial outreach, those initial contacts that you make will not necessarily get you the entire breadth of the community. One of the things that we've found with uh, our work in, in Germantown, and as I mentioned earlier, there are basically two neighborhoods in uh, Germantown. There's what's called West Germantown and East Germantown. A lot of the community organizations and a lot of the really active people are associated with West Germantown. And what we were finding was uh, we needed to make an even stronger effort to really connect with community organizations uh, and actors in East Germantown because they have been hyper invisible uh, in terms of communication. Uh, only time that they would ever see anybody is there, there's more violence in that particular neighborhood. And that's the only time that they would ever see anybody. So we needed to make, after assessing our own this is who we have now, we needed to take another step and say, now we need to really find people uh, to in East Germantown, uh, even though we had already taken those initial steps to get the project started. That's a great point. I know for the, you know, the work that we did in Kentucky, uh, in one case it was, uh, you all mentioned the library system uh, often being a potentially important and useful partner. And the work we did in Kentucky, it was the Cooperative Extension Service in the rural county that provided some resources and space. Uh, you know, they are run uh, out of the, uh, the University of Kentucky there, but they have an office in every, every county throughout the state and are there to mostly serve needs when it comes to nutrition and education, et cetera. And they became a partner that wasn't necessarily who you'd think of first. For some of the work that we did in Bowling Green, the International Center who helped service refugee communities became a really uh, vocal partner in a workshop that we did and, and was really interested and engaged in what could be done afterward. Uh, we did some stuff in Eastern Kentucky and there were some local businesses that offered up space and, and everything else that kind of saw it as part of their larger and, you know, so I think it is, you know, kind of thinking very broad and creatively about what are the resources of that community and who, uh, who are civically engaged. And it's not going to be the same across any given community, which I think back to the portable rather than scalable uh, framework that Latrell and Andrea started with is really, uh, really key. One thing, one question that came up uh, was about the, the word accountability and particularly in respect to uh, this discussion of community-centered models. What does accountability mean to each of you in this work when it comes to how news organizations that engage in a community-centered model might think about being accountable to their communities? Um, I think Latrell shared a little bit in the um, written portion, but just um, to add to that, I mean, I think for, for a lot of our projects, we're looking at sort of there being two-way relationships between communities and journalists, and so journalists being accountable to the communities that they're serving. So, for example, in Germantown, we host these regular accountability conversations, and some of the early ones were you know, really fascinating when you had journalists come in and talk about stories they had written with the communities that they'd written them about. Um, people were, I mean, you know, it wasn't just like a, let's just slam you for doing this, or, you know, it, 
it was it was very respectful and but critical. Um, and so because there were the reporters who had written the story and the editors there in the room, um, they were able to kind of dig into some of the kind of they were kind of able to have a conversation about why things were the way they were. So why do you always talk, quote, the same people? Um, why do you always use this person as a source? And, you know, one of the reporters in one of these conversations said, because they give good quotes. And so then we had to unpack what does that mean? Um, and how is it that journalists could kind of question some of their assumptions about what a good quote might be or the work that's needed to do, how you need to invest the time to sort of develop different kinds of um, relationships with your community so that you're not always relying on the, the easiest, quickest um, pathway. Um, and so that was an opportunity to kind of, they could kind of take that back and chew on it and, and kind of develop it. And at the same time, the community members could understand better the pressures and you know processes that the journalists had to go to go through, um, and so it sort of there was sort of a building of understanding and a building of a relationship through that sort of accountability conversation, and that's something we've tried to look at different opportunities to to explore. And real quickly, one of the things that actually happened in Chambersburg once we actually had the discussion was we brought together the local newspaper, a Spanish language newspaper, another hyper local newspaper. And what happened in that conversation was simply an acknowledgement that was necessary because they were willing to show up that we're not doing a very good job of connecting with your different communities. And, and, and out of that, again, the local newspaper public opinion decided to apply for a grant uh, to, to allow them to do work. We directly partnered with another hyper local called the Franklin County Free Press. And um, there's also uh, some conversations with the Spanish language uh, news outlet. And it was simply just the acknowledgement in, of we're not doing a good enough job. I think that that alone is something that really uh, can really spark a lot of um, change within communities just to say, all right, we, we need to do a better job. Well, uh, I should mention we had uh, uh, Wendy wrote in uh, just to also highlight public access TV stations could be another great and unexpected partner as you're thinking about organizations to work with to go back to a previous question. But kind of following up on this question of accountability, if we flip that around, uh, we had a question about how do you manage the expectations of the communities you're working with when it comes to journalistic ethics, impact, uh, what you're able to do? Um, how do you think about that? And, and Mike and Maleka, I'd love to hear uh, from both of your perspectives to start with. Uh, how, how do you manage the expectations as you start these community conversations? Um, well, I, I, I'll go first, I guess. Um, um, that's a good question. In the beginning, uh, I posted a um, like 10 ethics, um, 10 things that from, I think it was from the um, Society of Professional Journalists. Um, it was sort of like a code of ethics that I posted um, um, at some place on the blog. I think I've since this, since I've um, gotten a new website, I don't think it's there anymore, but I think I may consider posting it again, just so that it's, it's, it's there at all times, reminding people what what it is that you know we do, and one one thing is we try to do no harm. Um, uh, and so I think just having that reminder where people could to go to the about page and, and read it for themselves uh, for a long time kind of kept us in check. Uh, and there were times when I would write things and people would even like quote it back to me. <laughs> said, you know, I thought you, you know, your code of ethics said that you do this. Um, why are you doing this? I've had those messages uh, several times, and I've been forced to kind of answer them. Uh, and it, 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 so, yeah, it, it, it allows us to be on the same page and have the same standards as the reader um, and, and, and working in the same ethical framework. I think that was uh, pretty helpful and something that I might consider doing again. Um, I know for me that I'm not a professional journalist, but I think as far as uh, the expectations of my neighborhood and and uh, what what they expect and impact and everything that you were talking about, I definitely know that our team 
um, really stresses transparency and honesty. And for me, I, I stress humility and vulnerability as far as an organizer goes. And just making sure that people know that I might, I might make a mistake and I'm open to learning. We might make a mistake at Germantown Info Hub and we are open to learning. That making sure that people know that we are walking alongside everyone that is doing this work in my neighborhood and just making sure that that is the most important part that everyone knows that they're being heard and they're being seen and that we're just trying our best to make sure that those stories are accounted for um, accordingly. I think well, one, one more thing I was going to add is that the, the importance of presence too, um, just being oh, sorry, present. Sorry, Mike. Um, so yeah, <laughs> um, and, and, and I think uh, one thing that uh, us doing these Zoom, these virtual town halls, these um, with these ambassadors, is that uh, it's 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 allowed us more. Um, we're more comfortable in the virtual space, so now you know I'm, I'm listening to this and getting ideas of how I want to have like accountability discussions maybe every other week and, and we can easily do that now that we have the zoom uh, which we didn't even think to have before um, before doing the ambassador program so I think the comfort in the virtual space um, opens up some ideas for for having more of these discussions and having more face-to-face -face interactions with the, our readers so that they there's a platform for them to criticize us constructively and, and not maybe <laughs> do it in other ways so well, and some of what you both, Mike and Maleka, br brought up uh, are, you know, especially for people who are uh, journalists and have worked in a more traditional sort of journalism model, this can also be scary, right? You, you kind of have your controlled methods to receive feedback, uh, and yet uh, there are all these ways that a model like this kind of opens you up to hear more directly from your communities about what they think about your product uh, versus sort of, as, as I think the person asked the question said, you know, what you imagine they might feel versus hearing from them in a really direct way uh, about how they feel. Do you all have across the board any recommendations, any thoughts on how to overcome those fears that journalists might have about opening themselves up to this type of process? Um, my, 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 my take on that is we, and it's not just our research, there have been decades of research that have focused on the fact that there are certain communities and populations that are not served by local media. Uh, this goes back all the way back to 1968 current information report, which basically said communities of color are not served by local media. At some point, it, it takes the newsroom to make that step to say, this cannot continue. And that's the only way where you're actually going to see change inside of ecosystems and newsrooms when they, when people come up and say, we can't continue to do business as usual. And unless you, and so that takes that really, that personal evaluation of your newsroom and what you're doing and saying to yourself, this is what we need to do to be the best news outlet possible. So if the newsroom's not willing to do that, I would even question if you're going to have be effective in doing that but it's it, it takes that recognition that this is simply what is required of us at this moment and uh there have been efforts to actually do that to engage in that type of an interrogation i think i yeah just adding on to what latrell said i mean i think it's it is a very real question that it is a scary thing but you know as Malaka mentioned like vulnerability is necessary if if there's going to be an effort to kind of grapple with you know, what does this whole trust thing mean? And, you know, how is that going to be not repaired? Because for most of these communities, it was never there to begin with, um, but built in the first place. Um, and I think that, you know, these, these sorts of questions are necessary and it, it, it will require people to do things that are not necessarily something that they 
that they learned in journalism school. Unfortunately, hopefully that will change <laughs> as journalism schools adapt. Um, but I think that that sort of um, vulnerability will be required. Absolutely. Well, the, the question we have gotten multiple times uh, throughout the last uh, 30 minutes uh, has been a, a vital one. And that is, uh, in what way uh, does the, have these sorts of efforts been shown to sort of help news organizations in, in their bottom line? Um, if they're a more membership-based, uh, more donation-based nonprofit, if they're subscriber-based, if it's advertising-driven, you know, where do we see these sorts of efforts connecting up with um, the very real how you keep the doors open and the lights on types of questions? And I know, you know, particularly in New York City, Tao's been doing a lot of research. Sarah rafsky has been doing some, some good work about the real challenges at the hyper-local level of keeping these models alive. So just across the board, kind of from a, from a business model perspective, where do you see these community-centered approaches fitting in with the, the big revenue question that all hyper-local organizations are grappling with? Uh, you, can, you can take it, Andrea, first. <laughs> no, you please, please. <laughs> well, I'll, I was going to say that we, we're, 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 I'm more aggressively now more than ever focusing on growing our email list, um, which would open us up to, into, to, we would transition to a, to a membership based um, model. But first we have to, um, we really have to do a better job of engaging with our audience on a regular basis. So um, I've started sending out an email blast, a news blast every Monday, for instance. Um, and we want that, we want to collect uh, a lot of emails so that when we get to the point of making that ask, we, we have a captured audience um, to make it to. Uh, and it's beyond just putting it out on Facebook saying we need money uh, because that doesn't work um, as effectively as, as having our own captive audience. I um, mean, email allows you to do that. Um, I wish we had done it a long time ago. And what I'm saying when now Facebook is more, it's, I, I wanna be less and less tethered to Facebook than I have to be. And I think a lot of news organizations are, are feeling that urgency too because of all the problems on Facebook. And it really does cut into your audience engagement. It's not, it, it, it allows you to be less independent than you want to be. Uh, and, and the ambassadors, um, one thing that I'll, the, our next task, and I think it'll be simultaneous, simultaneous with, with putting together these virtual town halls is sending them in to, to get to, one, to engage with other people who may want the news, who may not even know about the paper, to, to help us get emails, help us get contacts, help us get engaged readers um, as well. So they, they can do some of that work for you. Uh, you know, we already have a lot of people who are effectively surrogates of the paper who, who like what we do, who, who value it, but that it, it kind of stops there. They go out and say, you know, I like the Village Free Press or, you know, I like what they're doing. And it's kind of like, okay, but we want to pick, we want to allow the conversation to be really sticky and to say, if you're out in a community saying that you value what we do and you're talking to somebody about it, get their email and get their number so, so that we can add them to our, our e-newsletter and we can ask them for donations. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's one of the ways we're going to grow our uh, captive audience uh, is by utilizing and leveraging our, our news ambassadors to kind of to be, to, to, to provide that mediation. Um, and it allow us to, to, to drive, you know, kind of scale our membership because we live in, our, my readership is Proviso Township effectively and, and, and there are roughly 14 communities in the township of roughly 150,000 people. And if we can get, you know, 100, 200 people, you know, uh, people as really um, uh, engaged audience members of each of those uh, suburbs that we want to cover, I think we can be in really good shape and each of them gave like $50 a year. Uh, that can be a, uh, you know, a scalable new a model, a revenue model on our part, at least scalable township wide. And it, it could allow us to be um, a, a more sustainable. Yeah, 
One, one thing I'll also throw in, Andrea and I, uh, one report that we wrote for CJR, which is called Sourcing Innovation from a Rural Journalism Lab, the work we did with the Ohio County Monitor, you know, they were very open with us and providing kind of, here's how much, it, here's how much our, our, our uh, work costs, here are all the hard costs, how do we pay for ourselves? Uh, and, you know, a lot of these things that we're experimenting with when it comes to community centered models, you know, that's, that's the big question. I just recommend if people are interested in that question, that's a, a, a helpful piece to go back and read as well when it comes to just, you know, a lot of these sorts of methods, it's not a direct one to one that it's going to be, you know, this is going to immediately lead to this revenue opportunity, which of course is part of the, the challenge of this work. Yeah, and just to pour, pour more, more cold water on it, I would say that I'm not sure that these projects can address. I mean, I, I think that, you know, Michael's right that there are there are some really good opportunities. And I think you might want to look at the membership puzzle project and a few other folks who've been doing quite a lot of research on this. Um, but I would say at least in the academic circles, the research is very mixed and it's not clear that this work will necessarily lead to directly to um, money and I think that's another reason why we need to have conversations about public funding for journalism as my daughter clearly agrees sorry so one question that came up as well was uh, membership models so you know a, c a couple folks were asking do membership models seem to be something that you all see more enthusiasm for and do you have any thoughts on how you drive people deeper into engagement with your organization through the community-centered models? Um, so um, I don't think the membership models alone will lead to sustainability to um, Andrea's, Andrea's point. Uh, I think the best path to sustainability, um, at least from for, for my publication, Village Free Press, I believe is gonna be to, to to have a diverse revenue model, so multiple revenue streams. Um, what I found is that us being in print has actually been um, counterintuitive. It, it's been pretty a pretty good financial idea um, because of legal revenue, and so municipalities are required to 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 uh, publish, and we get legal, you know legal revenue from foreclosure notices, and and so this year uh, we 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 got. Um, the assessor's office, the local town, uh, Cook County assessor's office appointed us to be kind of the legal paper of record um, to publish all of the assessments in all of Proviso Township. And so that, that, um, that alone is, is a significant chunk of revenue, like a lot of money. Um, and we were in the position to do that because we have been in, in print for at least a year. Uh, I think that that so legal, so that's just one source of revenue, but a membership revenue a model would only, it'll, it'll help to kind of um, um, feed into that bottom line. But I think you have to have a lot of, a lot of ways to, um, to, to utilize your membership model, just not by asking people for money regularly, but you know, doing creative things. Um, if we weren't in COVID, perhaps utilizing your membership model to do some creative events, for instance. Um, but we can still do that um, virtual events that people may be willing to pay for. For instance, so there there are a lot of different ways that you can tap into your membership model um, rather than just asking for. It doesn't just necessarily have to be a one dimensional exchange. You can you can utilize that membership model in a, a variety of ways um, by 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 serving people's need, over serving them content that they really rely on. Um, and, and you know having different price points for different types of members uh, we we're, we're exploring so it's a it's a variety of different ways that you might want to tap into that membership model but in addition not rely on that membership model to to lead to sustainability try to try to look for uh, other revenue sources to to help um, pat your bottom line <clears throat> I will appreciate that and I look at the clock and it looks like we're nearing the, the top of the hour or at the top of the hour. So just want to say a couple of final things. One is there was a question of whether we might be able to share uh, some of the slides that Latrell and Andrea presented at the top with attendees. We're going to work with Tao to look into that, uh, but certainly are, are willing and interested in doing so. Uh, so more to come to folks on that and follow up. 
Second, I should mention that for folks who are interested in these questions, Andrea uh, actually has just recently published a book uh, around some of these issues and Latrell is uh, uh, already uh, ready to give it a good uh, uh, a plug here. Community-centered journalism, engaging people, exploring solutions and building trust. So recommend folks who are interested in more, uh, check that out. And also, uh, as I mentioned, this is the second in a three-part series on redefining the local news crisis that the Tau Center is doing. At this time next week, uh, there's going to be a session that Emily Bell, the director of the Tau Center, will be moderating on partisan media and the 2020 election uh, tied to uh, local news. So be sure to be on the lookout for more information from the Tau Center about that event. Really appreciate you all joining us today. And uh, please don't hesitate to be in touch with us um, if you have any follow-up questions that you might be able to reach out to us on social media or elsewhere. Um, but thanks very much for your time.